And even when people do impressions, I love when people do a take on somebody instead of when they're really dead on. When they're dead on, I'm like, I'm impressed, but then I, I'm not as interested. But if someone does a take on somebody, it keeps me interested. Like, that, it reminds me of um, Daryl Hallman's take on Bill Clinton. Yeah. Like it wasn't just, he wasn't just mimicking him. He created a character. And I think right. that's what the best impressionists or the best um, people who do impressions on Saturday Night Live, like on paper, it's an impression, but they're actually creating a character. And the thing is, is once you get, once the audience buys you as that person, then it's, and you get real comfortable being that person, then you can riff. And I started doing that with Barbara Walters. Once I knew, like I was made to do her. It is, that is not something I wanted to do. Um, what do you mean? Uh, uh, Lauren wanted me to do her. And I was like, I don't do impressions. And because I didn't do impressions. And he goes, uh, I mean, I did characters, but not impressions. And, and it was like, no, he wants you to do her. And, and that's it. And so I was like, oh, shit, I'm, you know, and I, all I thought was that people are going to say she's no Gilda Radner. I was going to be compared to that. But then I thought to myself, well, it's been a while. And what take should I have on her? I have to have a completely different take. So I just studied her all over again, tried to get more of her mannerisms and then funny things that she would do in interviews. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, what makes her so good in an interview is she would give specific credits, compliments to whoever she was interviewing. Very specific. And when people are specific with you, with what you've done, you, you feel very seen, you know, and you let your guard down. You feel appreciated and respected. And so she would do that. And especially from a respected journalist like her, you know, to be seen would really probably feel good. And then once she established that, then she'd go in for the kill. Like you're a, you're a hip hop mogul, you're, a, you're a, um, an actor and a concert pianist. Why the porn? You know, I'm just speeding all of that up. But I loved, well, you're certainly one of the most controversial and talked about first ladies this nation has ever had. Like she doesn't do that. But I started having so much fun doing her that I was able to take liberties. Um, did you by any chance read the book Ladies Who Punch, The the View Tell All? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they, I mean, that book is phenomenal. Like everyone needs to read that book. But in that book, they share, like the original cast of The View says that it was, it was when SNL did that first sketch that The View really took off. I, I think it does give a show notoriety but it was like so ready to be spoofed i mean i watch it to this day i'm a total i gotta see the view every day i was doing barbara walters before that i would do her on 2020 and i would do her like um oh i used to love writing her specials remember her oscar specials oh yeah uh, the most intriguing people or you mm -hmm. know Try, I, oh, try, I, trying to get ricky martin to admit that he was gay before he was out yeah, the top 10 most intriguing people or whatever. And so I did a few of those. And then when The View happened, it was a totally, I mean, my God, that woman, she did everything. It was just so fun to have a place to do her all the time. Even though, even if she wasn't doing The View, I would still probably be doing her a lot because she did 2020. She did the specials. You know what I'm saying? What was it yeah. like? So on, on her last day of The View, they invited you on and you were literally at the desk with her. What was that experience like? We're sitting there. She's across from me and uh, she's all business. You know what I mean? Like she may say, so Sherry, how are you? Don't move that! Do not move that. And and it's you're just like uh, 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 you know. Oh yeah. No, oh, we we've all we've all seen and heard the Elizabeth Hasselbeck like recorded audio. We know. Yeah. 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 She <laughs> is all business, all business. And so, what was funny was she looks in the monitor and she goes, "Oh, my hair's a mess." My hair's a mess. And her hair and makeup team come out. They zhuzh her and blah, 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 blah. And then they go back 
And then a few minutes later, we're almost getting ready to, and she goes, my hair is still a mess. What's going on? My hair. And so they come back out again and they're like, Zh -zh -zh, and they go, Barbara, you're looking at Sherry's monitor. And because we, we looked exactly alike, like our dress, everything. And she started laughing. And I felt so good to have been a person that made Barbara Walters really laugh. And the funniest thing was that everybody was cracking up. Everybody was laughing. And then the hair and makeup people just walk off and I'm like, so nothing, nothing, nobody's gonna fix it. <laughs> And, and, and um, meanwhile, you're still doing Barbara Walters. I the, I remember the last time, I remember um, New Year's Eve turning into 2020. This is pre-pandemic. They, of course, Andy and Anderson had you to say, I mean, I don't remember what the line was, but it was some, it was obviously something to the effect of like, it this, was, is, this, this is, is 2020. 2020. Yeah, it was all about her saying this is 2020. So I just thought to myself, you know, I'll write about what's happened in this past year and I'll write it. You know, because she's got to talk about topical things, but it's fun to throw in what she finds and who she finds interesting, you know, who she thinks is cool to hang out with, you know, her name dropping. I was in awe of the groundlings. I'm like, because people always said, oh, you should do stand up. And I couldn't see myself doing stand up. And I said, and then a woman said to me once, you should do the groundlings. And I go, what's the groundlings? And she says, it's an improv troupe. And I seriously said, What's improv? And she's like, it's comedy you kind of make up as you go along. And a light bulb went off. I'm like, wait, what? And so I went, I saw everybody that had been there before me, like Lorraine Newman and Phil Hartman. And, and, uh, um, and I was just like, and then I saw a show and I was, the clouds parted. And the funny thing is, is I would have never dreamt that big. You know what I mean? To join to join a to join a troupe like a comedy troupe, no. To think that I could have been in a comedy troupe, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I hadn't acted before or anything. They, who was there at the same time as you? Who I used to watch was Kathy Griffin, Lisa Kudrow. What I know is the Groundlings uh, SNL didn't go to the Groundlings for many years. They wouldn't. No one could even get them there because the writers don't have to write. For you so the writers pretty much write whatever conceptually they want to write and they usually cast the same people over and over again so if there are people that sometimes never get written for you're you're told that you have writers but if i didn't write you would never see me you might see me at the end of a sketch but what was great about the groundlings is it taught me how to write and then i got into the main company and i was just like oh my god my dreams have come true. My dream was not SNL, it was to be a groundling. And I was temping at Disney legal a lot and it sucked, but- Sounds like a party. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, it wasn't. And then Chris Gattan had gotten uh, someone from SNL out to see him in a showcase. Mm. And so it's really all about, you know, about Chris. So he got a special show for himself to show off his stuff. And I, um, I had one sketch in there, you know, um, it was a showcase for him. And I think Will had, I don't know what he had in there, but I was temping at Disney that Monday and my manager calls me and goes, what are you doing next week? And I go, very funny, I'll be temping at Disney. He goes, no, you're gonna be flying to New York to audition for Saturday Night Live. I go, and I scream. But wait, 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 hold on a second. Wait, back, back up a second. So SNL is watching Chris Kattan's, essentially his audition or his showcase, his pre-audition. And you and Will had small parts in that. Yeah. And they noticed you based on your small, like based on basically as like a time filler while Chris Kattan yes. was like changing or something. Yes. Were you, you must have just been shocked. I just thought, you know, I hope I do well and they'll remember me for next What time. did you do? What were you doing? Like what was, you, what was, what was it that they I saw? Character that I, I did this character. I couldn't get on SNL for anything. Yeah, they saw me do one thing. Wow. And then I went out and I went out. It was me, Chris, Will, and Jennifer Coolidge, who's brilliant. So wait, so Jennifer, so you knew Jennifer Coolidge from the, she was in your troupe? I remember being in a, in a separate class from her, another class. And I'm thinking, 
oh my God, she's too pretty to be funny. And then I was wrong. So they, so they fly you, Will Ferrell, Chris Kattan, and Jennifer Coolidge to New York. Yeah. They put you up at a hotel. Mm-hmm. And what happens? You did like seven minutes. That's all. It's like you do like three different characters. And you had to do an impression. And I remember I didn't do impressions. So I did Lisa Marie Presley in an interview with Michael Jackson when they got married. And I just kind of ripped that. And then I, we found out weeks and weeks later that Will and I had gotten it. Chris ended up getting it like maybe six months later or something like that. Oh, wow. And yeah. was, was, was it Jennifer? I guess my, my bigger question around the Jennifer Coolidge thing, it actually sparks a broader question, which is the people in the groundlings, because you mentioned... You mentioned, uh, you know, Kathy Griffin, Lisa Kudrow, like a variety of talents. You know, Kathy Griffin, eventually, you know, she became an actress, but her background was in stand up. Everybody is coming with a different strength. Was every but uh, like a Jennifer Coolidge, like was her dream to like, was she crushed when she didn't get the SNL or was she like, whatever, I'm going to be an actress anyway. Like, this isn't my goal. I don't know, because I remember she got a show called She TV. And I saw her on a poster and I'm like, wow, she made it. And (laughs) I was like, wow, she did. But then the show kind of got canceled. Mm -hmm. I remember Lisa Kudrow got Frasier. She got the role of Roz. And then they replaced her. Mm -hmm. And I just used to think to myself, you know, how that must feel. Because I know people that took the classes that when they got dropped out of the class, they I just talked to some guy that I'm still friends with. He's still not over it. You put everything into, you know, and you get so far and then you can get cut, you know, and it's really good preparation for SNL because, you know, you write your thing and you're competing not with only with your fellow actors, you're competing with the writers. And then just, you know, a certain amount gets picked like 11 uh, sketches get picked and then and then only eight actually go to air. It's I always say it's like you auditioned every week to get a show you already got. You know? Seth Myers has talked about how it is so brutal. It is brutal until the good nights because you can still think you can be in your actually no, I it was either Seth Myers or I, I interviewed Rachel Dratch at for this show and she told me how it's so brutal you can be there in your ridiculous you're in the last sketch of the night it's making it to air you're in your ridiculous costume outfit and it gets cut for time yeah so now you're in now and she's relaying to me how she goes so now I'm in the good nights in a ridiculous let's say bunny outfit I'm just making it up and it never people are just like why is she in that outfit like people don't know I'm telling you to say that it's brutal is an understatement because I don't think people realize, you know, you have writers, but if I didn't write for myself, you know, Will w- could write for himself. He was a great writer, but he also got cast in a lot of things. So if what he wrote didn't get in, he knew he was taken care of. Yes, it's well, it's well known that Will Ferrell was a favorite of the writers. What do you attribute that to? Like the favorites that... He's hysterical and he's a white guy. And if you have mostly white guy writers, they're going to write their own pieces from their point of view, which is understandable. You know what I mean? Characters really mostly come from the the actor. Very rarely, I think, can a writer write a character. I know it's been done, but very rarely does a writer write a character for somebody. Like, that's why I, sometimes I would watch the show and I could tell when it was a writer's show and when it was an actor's show. Because when it was an actor's show, there was a lot of characters. When it's a writer's show, there are a lot of topical pieces. Oh, that's so interesting. That that's such like a that's a juicy bit of trivia. I like that. Oh yeah, yeah. And there's years when you can say, "Oh, it's a writer show," mm. and then there's years when it's an actor show. But um, anytime somebody comes there from the groundlings, you know they're going to do killer characters. So, how do you find out that you've that you got the gig that like you have made it on SNL? You so you remember um, they said Lauren wants to see you. Oh, I auditioned two times in New York and then a couple of weeks later, they said, Lauren wants to see you at Paramount. And 
I remember buying a dress I couldn't afford. What was that meeting like? So you're you're face to face with Lauren. He's like, um, Sherry, we want you to c- come to New York. And I was just the funny thing was he never said you got the show. And I'm thinking to shop. Uh, uh, wait, what, you know what I mean? Because he never said. And he goes, uh, we want you to continue to write. You'll have an office. And little did I know that I would have to write. I was so flattered. Wow, he wants me to write. Um, and I was like, oh, I mean, to say I was over the moon, it was ridiculous. It was, but I wanted to contain myself because I didn't want to ruin it for Will. And so I just said, um, he just wanted to find out more about me. And so I waited for Will and then he came out. When he came out, we just held each other's hand, walk into the parking lot and then just screamed and screamed. I remember going to phone booths. He called his mom, I called my dad. And it wow. was, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, I mean, amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I want to bring up a few, um, a few of my favorite collaborator collaborators of yours, p- actors that you've worked with, and if you can just share an anecdote or a memory um, of working with them. I would love that. Um, When I think of your era on SNL, I immediately think of Jim Carrey and his his first episode hosting SNL. Okay. The funny thing was he said when he first got there, I want to do the cheerleaders. My daughter's obsessed. I'm obsessed. And so it was really important. And he said to me, Sherry, I auditioned for SNL. And I went into a deep depression when I didn't get it so deep. It lasted like a couple of years. And I go, really? He goes, you don't know this is the biggest dragon for me to slay. And it meant the world to him. And I could tell. And so we took really so much care when we wrote the sketch. And he ended up having, I think, the best show that I ever saw anybody have the whole five years I was there. That lifeguard sketch? I mean, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, Jess. Steve Korn wrote that sketch, right? Real good writer, Steve Korn. He wrote that sketch. I can't tell you how many times he put it up. It didn't get in. You know, like, you know. uh, Like he he pitched it and they didn't want it. it. Yeah. And then the funny thing is, is like, once you pitch something in front of everybody and everybody reads it and it doesn't make it in to bring it back, it's brutal because- you have, we sit through so many sketches to have to have one come back that we already heard. You know, it's like, uh, can't you? Uh, we said no. But every time he brought that back, I thought to myself, that's a funny sketch. I mean, I'm picturing it. And then I'll never forget it. He brings it back for Jim. Now, this sketch has been already read out there at least three times, at least. Jim wants it in. And I am telling you, I laughed my ass off and I was so happy for Steve Korn. And that is a testament to, you know, as hard as a room is when you believe in something and you can see it to just, yeah, it's humiliating. It's very, very hard. I mean, I remember I did this, the character simmered down now and, um, and it didn't get in. And then, um, my guy that I wrote it with, Matt Peepon, goes, Sherry, we should bring that back. And I go, no way, I'm not bringing that back in that room. You know, it's a stupid character. It's silly. And, you know, and he goes, Sherry, I really think we should bring it back. So he goes, I got your back. I got your back. You're not alone. And I'm like, yeah, I'm alone. So I'm in the table. And, and he goes, we'll call it something different. I go, well, as soon as I say simmer down there, then you're going to know it's not different. And he goes, um, Sherry, just... So I remember, you know, Lauren Michaels goes, returns, and we start reading, reading. And then the first time I go, Simba Dan, nah, all this is all I hear. Oh. And someone actually held up the, the sketch and then dropped it like that. It, when I say it's a rough room, and I'll never forget who it was. And I was just like, I was so embarrassed that I started laughing and crying. I couldn't even get the words out simmered down. I wasn't even trying to act it. All I wanted was the sketch to be over with. 
I just wanted it to be over. And I knew I had to say that freaking line like 15 more times. And I'll never forget, like Tim, Tim Meadows was cracking up. And I'm like, is he laughing at the sketch or is he laughing at me? I can't, I'm losing it. Like I'm, I was like, I mean, there were tears coming down my face because I was embarrassed, but I was laughing and um, it ended up getting in. You know, I remember what I didn't, this didn't even occur to me until you literally just told that story. I'm remembering how during this era, there was so much criticism. I, I remember the criticism that you guys were just doing catchphrases. And people like there was there were think think pieces on it like it, one, it was one of those SNL is dead they're 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 not even writing sketches they're just doing catchphrases did that okay, you know what affect that you guys? wasn't true in our era I don't think that was true in our era I think that was true more of the era before us but I will admit that simmer down was nothing but a catchphrase you know because. It was like one summer, my friend Kenny and I are driving around. We're making each other laugh, saying, yelling out the window, pick up your poop now. Slow it down now. And we're just being silly, making each other laugh. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, so that was and that's what made it so embarrassing in the room yeah. was, you know, making copies, you know, the stingster, you know, and I really just thought to myself, that's what this is. I'm not going to, you know, try and pepper it with any kind of intellect. Or any kind of, you know, subtext, whatever. It was a catchphrase and it made me laugh and it made my friends laugh. And so that, you know, I turned her into a character, whatever, you know, um, I gave her a little bit of depth. Jim. Oh, Will and I over the summer were was invited to Jim's house for dinner. So we go and he's having this dinner party and some fancy people were there. I said, hey, Jim, after dinner, I go, do you mind if I look around? And he's like, no, go ahead. I was looking around and I go into this room and he's got the Joker all in, in, in cased in glass. He's got Ace Ventura. That like the costumes? The costume in glass encased, the full costume. Characters that eat movies encased in glass. And then I saw the cheerleading uniform. And I was like, what? So I run out to Will and I go, I show him, like, look. And then I said, Jim, why do you have cheerleaders in case in glass? She goes, Sherry, that meant more to me than anything you could imagine. And I go, and he goes, as I said, it was the biggest dragon for me to slay. And me doing, being a part of, he goes, you don't know how much I loved you guys doing that. He goes, and I, just to see that that meant that much to him, that he would encase it with all of his iconic roles. Yeah, that was that was a very, very special show. I thought it was stellar from beginning to end. I go, you know what? It's way better to host it than to have to be on it. You did it the right way. <laughs> all right. Um, how did the Curb Your Enthusiasm opportunity come to you? I remember Larry David called me at home and I was so excited that I really wasn't paying attention to what he was saying. Like, I don't know if you've ever done like where you're so excited um, or you're just thinking of something else. You're not taking in the information. I wasn't really, cause I thought I'll find all about this later. Essentially what he said to me was going to be all the information I was ever going to get. I showed up, there was no script. I was so intimidated and I kept saying, is there any script? Is there even one piece of paper? Like, I don't understand this. And I didn't know anyone good enough to say, I don't get it. What's going to happen? I have nothing memorized. No, not. And then it's like action. And I'm thinking, you know, you are truly improvising. And you're not sure how much to keep going. And you don't want to step on his toes. It's, it was very, very scary and intimidating. I'm so glad that it turned out well. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, that was crazy. You know, like I couldn't say to him, Larry, I didn't listen to what you were saying. Right. <laughs> right. So excited. I would, I didn't know him well enough to say, you're not going to believe this, but I was so good. I couldn't say that to him. So I didn't say anything, but it was, yeah, that was, that was an experience. Amazing. 